Okay, I think it's time to get started. More and more people are entering the room. But first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, good morning to those of you who join overseas. A very warm welcome to today's ESAP webinar in which we want to discuss the larger economic impacts and potential political implications of the EU's wide and broad agenda to achieve strategic autonomy. Those of you who are familiar with contemporary EU policy making are certainly aware of the EU's ambitions to achieve economic resilience, technological leadership, global standard setting power, or simply the EU's ability to make its own choices and shape the world around it through leadership and through engagement, as it is stated in the EU's recent trade policy review. There are many definitions of ambitions for achieving strategic autonomy, and most of them, I would say, are recent and also well-intended. At the same time, there are many risks. Above all, the risk of the EU becoming more and more isolationist, and that strategic autonomy policies encourage the diffusion of protectionist policies globally particularly in countries with weak institutional capacity. And there are costs, costs associated with domestic regulation, costs from new regulation in the area of trade and investment, short-term costs and longer-term costs resulting from changes in the EU's industrial landscape over time, changes in firm level productivity, changes in companies' capacity to innovate, to grow internationally, to scale, to remain or become internationally competitive. And these are impacts from inward looking policies that we have seen in many other parts of the world over the past decades. And recognizing these impacts, ESIP commissioned Frontier Economics, a leading consultancy, to undertake a study measuring these to the large extent economic impacts of strategic autonomy policies. The study's findings show that, to take this right away, if implemented, the EU's strategic autonomy agenda could limit trade and production in the member states. It could reduce European citizens' living standards. And it could create inequalities and political tensions between the member states. And depending on the stringency of the measures involved, Amar, we'll get back to this in a minute. Aggregate income in the EU would fall by several billion euros annually, especially if the EU's trading partners retaliate. In the next 50 minutes or so, we want to learn more about the study by Frontier, and we want to discuss the findings in a broader context. We have invited the Swedish trade minister, Joan Fossell, to join us to present the keynote today, but unfortunately, more pressing commitments uh, are there that he needs to attend to. However, we have three outstanding experts with us today on our panel, promising an insightful discussion of various aspects of strategic autonomy policy making in the EU. With us today are Amar Beckenrich, Bettina Rudloff, and Nigel Corey. Amar is a senior associate and the lead on international trade policy at Frontier Economics in Geneva. Uh, he will kick off with a presentation of key findings of the study measuring the impacts of the EU's approach to open strategic autonomy. You will find the study on ESAP's website on download. I will then hand over to Bettina Rudloff. Bettina is the senior associate at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, SWP, SWP in Berlin. Her focus is on EU trade policy, development policy, and agricultural policy. And Bettina is also the author of a brand new publication on economic resilience, pitfalls and consequential effects the EU must take into account in its crisis management. And finally, we have Nigel Corey, the Associate Director for Trade Policy at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation in Washington, D.C. 
Nigel is an outstanding scholar in global tech policy making, focusing on technology standards, cross border data flows, data governance, intellectual property. And his recent work is about the EU using technology standards as a protectionist tool in its quest for cyber sovereignty. I know that we have a very large audience today, but I'd like to invite all of you in the audience to use the chat box to raise questions to which we can get back to in the second part of today's panel. Now, without further ado, let me hand over to Amar. Amar, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Matthias, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today for this um, webinar, I'd like to thank uh, SEEP for convening it and also for commissioning the work that um, I will present to you uh, now shortly. Uh, before I start, I'd like to also acknowledge the contribution of my co-authors, uh, Ben Shepard, uh, who's based in New York, and uh, Thomas Bailey, uh, who's based at Frontier in the UK. Um, so thank you. I'll just share my screen now. And this is the moment where you all, I will always hold my breath to make sure that things hoping that things work uh, and, uh, um, and then proceed. So, is that all clear? Um, Matthias, maybe you could just indicate if uh, super good from your side. Yeah. And does the screen change when I change? Yes, it works very well. Okay, good, excellent, uh, great. So, um, thank you, everyone. And uh, in these few minutes, I'd just like to give an overview of our study uh, to explain what we understand by strategic autonomy, how we set around measuring its impacts, what these impacts are, and what its implications might be. Uh, so, to begin with, what do we mean by strategic autonomy, and what's driving it? And there are many ways of considering. Uh, this concept, but perhaps the best place to start is to look at the, the Commission's pronouncements itself. And writ large, strategic autonomy is about uh, the EU's ability to make its own choices uh, in terms of policy shape the world around it in a way that reflects its strategic interests and values. And if we look at what's driving this, we can see that there are a number of different forces um, which we can perhaps dig into a, bit more, uh, into a bit more detail later on. Uh, there are concerns about industrial rivalry uh, involving major uh, players and jurisdictions in the world and, and control over global value chains. Uh, that dovetails with concerns about um, how to accommodate the rise of China in the global economy. Dovetailing with the idea of industrial rivalry is a question of geopolitical rivalry. Um, that's partly expressed in, in trade terms as a certain sense of buyer's remorse at the impacts of China's accession to the WTO. Um, and the worry that interdependencies in an economic sense are not creating political convergence and where there are political divergences, these economic independent interdependencies can create issues. The most recent obvious example being uh, relations with Russia uh, in the context of the Ukraine war. But the, these concerns uh, predate that. These are just observations, by the way. I'm not necessarily commenting on their validity, but uh, these are some of the, the concerns that are, that, if you like, have given rise to this idea of strategic autonomy. Uh, besides that, we also see uh, concerns about how trade interacts with broader policy objectives that might be sought uh, by the EU and its member states. These essentially turn around how to remedy various sorts of market failures uh, relating to sustainability and decarbonization and value chains, uh, the governance of digital markets. And finally, there are concerns about resilience and control of our value chains that have particularly emerged uh, in the wake of the pandemic, but are also related to more longer standing concerns about uh, resilience to external shocks, whether those are geopolitical events or climatic shocks. So there's a, there's a if you like, a cluster of, uh, of issues that are 
embodied, if you like, in the, the concept of strategic autonomy. You'll see that in the presentation, I've highlighted the concept of value chains. Uh, and I've bolded those, that expression. That mainly reflects the fact that a lot of um, the ideas behind strategic autonomy really turn around the control of these global value chains, which have been the driving force of international trade in the last few decades. And that's an important uh, issue that will uh, drive some of the results that we look at in a short while. Now, what are the implications? Uh, I, I guess as a first A side, uh, it's, it's worth knowing that these concerns are not unique to the EU. We've seen them expressed in the United States and various um, aspects of policy interventions there in, in, uh, in, in its trade policy settings. And not all of these are new concerns. Uh, if you go back to the 1980s and 1990s, you'll find similar sorts of concerns cropping up in the area of agriculture, for example, uh, and also in relation to international competition and manufacturing. Only back then it was in relation to Japan and the East Asian new, newly industrializing countries, uh, as opposed to China now. And there was this quote that I found in J Jagdish Bhagwati's uh, exposition of protectionism in the late 80s and the late 90s, um, where the, the president of Fiat was saying that the single market must offer an advantage to European companies, and this is a message we must insist on without hesitation. That is, if you like, a, a, a direct line you can draw from that sort of thinking to uh, more recent ideas about developing EU national champions to allow the EU to compete more effectively on the global stage. But having said that, there are aspects to strategic autonomy that do reflect uh, uh, an, an important uh, departure, if you like, from the, the previous trend of policies. And what we did in our report was to identify four clusters of, um, of policy proposals that uh, ha, are being discussed currently in, related, in relation to strategic autonomy. Uh, these are proposals uh, that promote industrial policy objectives uh, through interventions that actively favor EU industries and businesses. So here you find things like the new industrial strategy, uh, specific uh, initiatives like the EU CHIPS Act, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and other such interventions that are actively geared towards uh, uh, promoting industrial policy and favoring uh, EU, uh, um, uh, EU industries in, in global competition. Uh, we also have regulations that are aimed at correcting market failures, uh, primarily in the operation of EU markets. And these really, by and large, relate to the governance of digital markets. And there the concerns turn around issues of privacy, turn around issues of market power, uh, and how they ought to be addressed. Uh, related to that, um, there are regulations aimed at correcting market failures in production and processing methods. This again reflects the, the internationalized operation of global value chains and the concerns in the EU to ensure that these value chains reflect concerns about sustainability, uh, decarbonization, the respect of uh, of labor standards and so forth. They're regulations that largely have an extraterritorial application. So sustainable forests, for example, sustainable batteries are an example of these. And finally, there's a cluster of measures which are really EU proposals to take policy action uh, to respond to behavior or trade measures taken by partners. So responses to subsidies, um, uh, uh, the uh, measures taken to enforce compliance with, with trade rules. Um, these, these are the sort of contingent measures that are envisioned uh, under the umbrella of strategic autonomy. And I guess where they mark a departure is that they reflect uh, a willingness by the EU to act unilaterally uh, on these measures as opposed to working uh, as has been the case more traditionally within the framework of multilateral rules. Now, to be clear, not all of these uh, measures by any means amount to protectionism, uh, but most of them do have a trade restricting potential. And that was what we wanted to look at in a bit more detail, was the way in which these measures might, um, might create trade costs and, um, and therefore have an effect on, on economic well-being and welfare. 
so just moving on to the next slide. So how do these ec economic impacts of strategic autonomy and the various clusters of proposals play out uh, via international trade? Well, what we did was we used a methodology to estimate the impacts of these policies on trade costs between the EU and its partners using what we call in, in, uh, in trade policy analysis, a gravity model of trade, which measures the effects uh, of policy restrictions on trade between countries. And essentially they capture the effect to which policies make it more or less profitable to supply markets overseas relative to supplying markets at home. Now, because we're looking at policy proposals, we had to make assumptions as to how these policies would, in principle, be implemented. And so we came up with different configurations, uh, assuming uh, respectively a low and a high level of restrictiveness and stringency associated with each of these policy initiatives. And in the high scenario, we also assumed some degree of retaliation by, uh, by key trade partners in response to the measures taken by the European Union. And uh, our report goes into more detail into the modeling and the instruments we used. Uh, and here I'm just focusing on the main results. But the main result is that strategic autonomy acts as a tax on the EU's external trade. So when you implement the measures envisioned, what you find is that trade within the EU arise, arises, intra-EU trade rises, uh, but extra EU trade, that is the trade between the EU and its partners uh, outside the EU, falls and falls to a larger extent. And we have roughly symmetric effects for exports and imports. And that's what the panel on the right is showing. You can see that the negative impacts on extra EU trade are significantly greater than the impacts on intra-EU trade. Now, what's driving these results? Uh, the primary drivers of these measures are what we call referred to as the category one measures, that is measures taken by the EU to actively intervene in markets for industrial policy purposes, uh, largely through the use of subsidies and other forms of financial support. What we've called over the last decade or so murky protectionism, that is protectionism that isn't overt in the form of tariffs and quotas, but do through the use of government financial support, essentially distort competition between, uh, between businesses or between sectors. And those have a significant, uh, significant drive of these effects. Uh, the contingent measures also play a significant role. They're the next important cluster of measures driving uh, these results. So that includes duties, for example, that may be imposed by the EU to respond to perceived subsidies in, in, uh, in partners. Uh, it includes measures taken to enforce compliance with, uh, with, with trade rules or responding to restrictive procurement practices. Those are an important driver of these costs. And finally, we have some contribution of measures taken um, uh, essentially to, to correct for market failures and digital uh, in, in, in digital markets. And here their effect is not so much on the policies per se, but the degree of regulatory fragmentation it creates internationally in digital governance. That is the extent to which the EU's regulatory regime for digital markets departs from those of its partners. The broad uh, takeaway message here, though, is that the main source of these negative impacts comes from the EU's own policies, not the measures taken by partners uh, in, uh, as retaliation. So it's the EU's own measures on strategic autonomy that are driving the costs that the EU itself faces. Uh, so we looked at the trade costs. What are the, the more general costs on living standards? Uh, and to work that out, we used a class of general equilibrium model known as a new quantitative trade model. And the, the description for that is found in our report. And what we found is that the, the annual losses are relatively significant. They're essentially equivalent to what you might get from the EU signing a large free trade agreement with one of its partners in the tune of 12 to 22 billion uh, across the EU 27. Uh, those are static effects. If you include long run effects via productivity and innovation, that the cost could be three to five times larger. So these are significant effects. 
uh, by any measure, uh, and they're not evenly spread across the EU27. Uh, the larger member states are less exposed than smaller ones. And for example, if you compare France and Germany, they're significantly less uh, adversely affected than, say, um, Ireland or the Baltic states. And that's, that's a relatively intuitive conclusion. The smaller you are, the more dependent you are on trade for, for your living standards and the bigger the cost you face. And that has some important implications, I guess, for the political economy of strategic autonomy. If you look at who are the primary proponents of the concept, uh, they are ones who are perhaps less exposed than some of their EU counterparts. Uh, the, the welfare effects are, are largely driven by the effects of import restrictions on the price of goods and services, which uh, on an annual basis would amount to be between 0.2 and 0.8%, which is again a non negligible impact. So what are we to make of this concept of strategic autonomy and is it to some extent self-defeating? Now to nuance our findings we need to focus on the fact that our, our research has focused on the impacts of these measures via trade. Um, so one way of considering it is to take the cost that we are measuring in uh, as a consequence of these trade effects and to see, well, are the benefits of some of these policies, especially when it comes to things like meeting regulatory objectives in relation to market power or, or um, privacy in, in, uh, in digital markets, are those benefits worth these costs? Noting that there might also be broader costs than the pure trade costs that we've, um, we've measured. But I suppose what the costs do is to invite a reflection on how far the overall objectives uh, sought by strategic autonomy can be achieved through other means. Um, as I said, a, a big driver of these costs are uh, what we call murky protectionism through the use of government financial support. Now, our trade rules internationally are relatively more relaxed about subsidies than there are about other measures. And for good reason, because subsidies can be used directly to correct for market failures. And so I suppose one thing to reflect on is, could some of these measures be more precisely targeted at the root cause of market failures, such as R&D and innovation, as opposed to production-based subsidies? A second question might be, to what extent is, if you're favoring regulatory uh, uh, um, if you're favoring the development of reg regulation in various, me in various markets, to what extent can you uh, foster regulatory cooperation to reduce the costs that come with fragmentation? And finally, I guess the idea of uh, rejecting unilateralism in dealing with perceived distortions uh, 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 in, in partners. And I guess one of, the one of the implications of our findings that partners, these major partners, the EU, uh, deal with also do face significant costs as a result of uh, the, uh, the EU's approach to strategic autonomy. And in our modeling, we've been relatively conservative about our assumptions regarding their retaliation. And clearly, a higher degree of retaliation would uh, engineer further costs. So, it, writ large, um, as it stands, strategic autonomy could be self-defeating from the EU's perspective, partly because it does impose costs on the EU itself. And these costs could have adverse distributional impacts as well, which we haven't looked at in detail, but usually an increase in price will, uh, in, in price levels for, across goods and services will, all else being equal, have adverse distributional Im uh, impacts. Uh, on an income basis, there might be other aspects, uh, uh, notably gender-related impacts, which are probably worth digging into uh, and which would be a, a fruitful next uh, step of research. Um, the, the effects on partners as a result of uh, the EU's pursuit of strategic autonomy could compromise uh, the extent to which the EU can project its soft power. And I suppose if one of the underlying ideas of strategic autonomy is to influence uh, partners in a way that aligns with EU interests, one way of, of strengthening that influence is to choose measures that are less likely to impose costs both on the EU and on partners itself. 
and which might enc encourage convergence towards something that looks a bit more like, like best practice. And I guess finally, a systemic issue, which is that strategic autonomy really uh, reflects uh, a move towards a greater level of fragmentation in global economic governance. The EU is a large player globally. And as you see uh, in the results, intra-EU trade, that is trade within the EU rises, but extra-EU trade falls. And that really is a reflection of an increased level of fragmentation globally that comes from strategic autonomy. And that, that has its own costs, as we saw in this, uh, in this presentation, but it has longer systemic costs in the sense that we are at a moment where we are trying to deal with large scale systemic issues such as climate and sustainability. And what you don't really want in such a world is a higher level of fragmentation in economic governance. Now, now, economists, as much as they might be accused of being naive, are not naive. We know that there are political forces that are driving this. But I suppose what's always been the case is that uh, institutions, particularly institutions like the WTO, have tried to contain those pressures, uh, channel them into ways that are transparent and can be the object of disciplines. And to the extent that that philosophy or to the extent that strategic autonomy marks a departure from from that philosophy um, does then carry longer term risks both for the eu and its partners uh, i'll leave my observations there and later on happy to return to any of these points in in um, in the question and answer session and discussion following uh, other interventions so thank you yeah, thank you very much, Omar. That was a very interesting and, uh, in many ways, excellent presentation. Uh, allow me just one follow-up question. Um, you said that strategic autonomy as it stands, it will likely be self-defeating, at least for some member states. And you presented a range of quantitative estimates for the trade impact of new subsidies on the one hand, but also new market regulation and sanctions or trade remedy measures imposed on countries that do not follow international or EU rules. And I wonder how these impacts compare over time, for example, over a period of, say, 15 years from now. So, um, in your opinion, having dealt with a very broad spectrum of EU policies, which ones do you consider most harmful for economic development in the EU uh, and in particular in smaller and also less economically developed EU countries, like, for example, Central and Eastern European countries? Thanks, Amethyst. That's a, that's a, a very pertinent question. So in our modeling, the immediate hit comes from uh, measures that are directly distorting of uh, of trade and uh, industrial activity, and those are the uh, those are what we call the category one measures, which uh, heavily turn around subsidies. In the longer run, as we said, um, yeah, there are impacts by innovation and production, and so particularly for smaller economies which might be less de dependent on a manufacturing base and more dependent on the services base, you would imagine that uh, policies that relate to um, to technology, to digital markets might might emerge as a, as a major source of um, of costs, particularly if there are important frictions that are introduced between uh, the EU and its trading partners through an increasing fragmentation and divergence in uh, in in the governance and regulation of of these markets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... Let's now give our two discussants the opportunity to express their views. And let's begin with Bettina. And Bettina already put an interesting question, and I think a very, very relevant question in the chat box, um, actually addressed to you, Amar, but maybe also a question um, for, for Nigel to, to elaborate on. And that is, do you know um, of a methodology that also accounts for the political benefits of strategic autonomy and allowing you know to weigh the costs and the benefits of each and every regulation. We might want to come to this uh, back to this in a minute. So, um, Bettina, uh, you worked a lot on 
EU agricultural policy in the past. Amar also briefly referred to it in his presentation. So what are your perceptions about what is going on uh, at EU policymaking these days? And what are your views about um, the study and the results that Amar just presented? Yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for all the participants. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to have received already this study and had a look uh, into it and the possibility to comment a bit on it. Uh, first of all, I would say it's very important to try somehow to operationalize or quantify these quite vague idea of these yeah, how to say political objective or sometimes maybe even used kind of catchword being strategic autonomy or another uh, term, AMA, you already uh, referred to, which is resilience. And what can that actually mean? And if you don't try to operationalize it, you can't really evaluate any kind of policy. Are you going to be more strategic autonomous or more resilient or less. So this is a first observation. It's very important, this kind of work. Um, especially, I like very much that you uh, referred specifically not only to goods or trading goods, but to services and thereby as well to a whole and broad set of measures being not only tariffs, but non-tariff measures. So this, I think, is very important. What is yeah, very difficult to judge is the question I raised. You very much are focused, of course, to the costs. What is with the benefits? I mean, there's an, of course, a starting point why the political world, world, sorry, world, sorry, uh, followed this idea of resilience or autonomy and. I know it's different categories, so the political benefits is different than economic costs. However, we should bear that in mind and thinking about all the recent tensions on international markets, it's clear that this even quite qualitative idea becomes so overwhelming. Having said that, I would like now as well to share my uh, screen with you and I have the same fear like uh, Ama already had. Could you give me a sign whether you see my... Yeah, we can see it well. Perfect. So what I would like to share with you is just some bits of the work I did, which could perfectly uh, fit or accompany the results of Amar's and his team's study. So what I did is I did a study on resilience and the question, how is resilience politically addressed in different type of European policies? And Matthias sent me some or all of us some guiding questions. So I try to refer to these guiding questions, which are the two mentioned there, um, being what are, let's say, what are the uh, ambitions and what policies could be con considered? And my major observation is that the aims and ambitions often are more implicitly defined. However, they are often since long time defined in different policies. And the second one is that resilience or autonomy often is linked to the domestic supply security. And I just give you three examples of three European policies for that. Trade policy, we already heard a lot in AMA's uh, presentation. So typically you find, for instance, in gut rules, um, yeah, principles like countries may react on supply shortages. One issue recently is, for instance, export restrictions which can be defined, you should notify them and so on by supply shortages. You somehow can as a country via trade measures respond to market crisis and you find the very interesting and very sensible target of national security, which is got article 21 or public moral even, which is one exception under GATT Article 20. So with this kind of links within trade rules, certain measures can be applied, even though the general idea is 
of course, by with GUT and WTO to have an open and rules-based trade. So you can uh, define exceptions. Huh? And uh, another relevant measure, for instance, thinking about export restriction is if you use them, you should consider spillover effects of such measures for other countries. This is the issue of trade policy. Another very important and famous European policy area is uh, the raw materials. So there we have since long the idea of criticality. So this is a criterion which is used to define a list of critical raw materials for the EU. And one idea is um, that these are raw materials very important for the European uh, processing sector and you should be able to react, react to supply shortages. What is interesting is that criticality is defined as well by uh, a parameter called governance quality of the delivery region. So it's not only pure economic criteria, but as well pol policy governance. Uh, and the measures built on that is there's regularly defined a list of critical raw materials. It was 20 goes, it started with 20 years ago with, I think, 10 or 15 raw materials. Now we ended up with 30. So there's increasing uh, extended catalog. And it's built certain partnership, raw material partnership for infrastructure, for instance. Um, another area which gained a lot of political awareness, at least in Germany, is foreign investments. How to handle that? We have in the EU the uh, screening regulation. And uh, we had just the case, the China Chinese question, the Costco company for um, yeah for investing within a certain part of services in the Hamburg harbor. And the screening regulation says you should, with your screening criteria, um, look at national security. Here it comes again, and public moral. And you should as well screen, uh, referring to the criteria of certain defined public aims, one is health. So in case you see a danger for these uh, objectives within the screening process, you could exclude certain foreign direct investments. Having said that, you, and that is only three examples, there are a lot of other examples. If you look at public procurement policy in the EU and so on, you have different links to what could be meant with strategic autonomy or resilience. I would like to end with a very famous, very, maybe very long-standing European policy, which is the agriculture policy, because According to my experience and my analysis, you can learn a lot. And I could imagine Nigel will know that regarding technical regulation. Huh? Agriculture policy is a typical <laughs> policy where we have a lot of technical regulations. And not only that, we had a kind of within history and Agriculture policy is one of the founding policies of the European Union. So very, very old and long experiences. And we had a kind of self-reinforcing spirals of action. So you started with one measures and you had to accompany the next and the next and the next and the next. What happened? In the founding uh, phase, the idea was to increase European food security. Remember, we've, we are in the 50s, just after the Second World War. And the idea was to increase food security. The US did the same. Huh? That was a really a policy objective. So when started with a kind of measures like fixed guarantee prices and the state as a demanding actor, so public purchases, you had then, that is now the spiral, the dynamic, you had to accompany that with very high tariffs to avoid undermining this increased price level. In the end, it was so successful that you had a lot of surpluses, milk, sea, butter mountains, and so on. So you need to have public stocks and even surpluses destruction. And because the price difference was large, internal prices and world market prices, you had to pay 
by public money export subsidies, which in the end destroyed competition on the world market. So you see there was a kind of self-interactive uh, dynamic. And the risk is clear. There is inefficiency. There is a huge budget pressure on public budget and international spillovers, so for competing actors. But there are lessons we have learned and we can learn from these long-standing experiences. So there are some very good examples, I would say. There's one market monitoring tool, a very sound one, which had been implemented by G20. Um, the idea is for all economists um, to have kind of rational decisions must be based on rational market information in sense of how is the market structure. Uh, so there's no need, let's say, for panic export restrictions. That was the idea of the G20. This system is called AMIS, and it's now copied a bit in other sectors, like in the metals and minerals. Another idea which uh, followed this very complicated system was to have a kind of subsidies classification in order to gather spill over for others. So to identify difficult subsidies, one system is from the OECD and that are, it's called PSE and CSE that stands for producer subsidy equivalent or consumer subsidy equivalent. And for all OECD plus a set of additional countries, you could measure very detailed what type of agriculture subsidies are implemented and what type of effects do they have for the environment or other competing countries. And the WTO actually took that over in a kind of subsidy traffic light system saying, this type of subsidy is allowed, this not. So green, amber, red. So these are, because of this difficult policy area with all these spillover, these are things one could think about in general in order to, yeah, to support maybe resilience if that's a policy goal. However, be aware of the trade-offs and try to limit them with these kind of measures. Hereby, I stop. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Bettina. Um, I'm glad you referred to the potential to, you know, trigger an open and differential intervention spiral, uh, particularly the case of subsidies. I mean, if you think of the uh, EU's experiences or member states' experiences with the with subsidies for solar panels, you created a lot of overcapacity and then uh, added tons of support measures afterwards to, in an attempt to safeguard an industry in decline. Uh, but if I say, understand you correctly, you're not against subsidies per se. In your work, you um, argue that EU resilience strategies can, in a way, learn from um, the OECD and also the WTO, you know, the International Agricultural Market Information System. Now, I wonder how these systems could be, in a way, operationalized um, for subsidies and state ed programs that have been launched recently, like the, the EU Chips Act, or uh, state ed programs in areas that are of strategic importance uh, to the EU. What do you think? Um, well, exactly the what you said in the in the in the letter phase. That is the issue. So my idea is this agriculture very problematic vicious circle, let's say, um, could be used to learn, to be aware of certain trade-offs we experienced in this policy. And um, this subsidy classification, the OECD starts now trying to apply this really very old system, 60 years or so, for other sectors. But the large but is, the real political pressure in agriculture came from the WTO in a time frame where WTO was a very st still, unfortunately, a very uh, powerful institution. So meaning that it is clear that on for agriculture, only these certain type of traffic light subsidies are uh, compatible 
in WTO terms. This is not, and, and we have an agriculture agreement at the WTO defining that, which is not the case for other sectors. So as a first step, it's only more a conceptual idea. It's not as strict and powerful unfortunately, I guess, uh, like for agriculture. However, one should think about that, trying to find a kind of type of classification, but I'm happy how Nigel maybe uh, react on that for other sectors. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, let's um, pass on to Nigel. Um, Amara is based in Geneva, you, Bettina, you're based in Berlin. Nigel, you're based in Washington, D.C., and I know that many people, at least those working in policymaking, have a, a particular view on what is going on in the EU these days, even though sometimes you can draw parallels to what has happened in the past in the U.S., in particular uh, under the Trump administration to some, I may, I may want to say a large extent also under the Biden administration. So what are your, your views uh, on the strategic autonomy debate here in the EU? Uh, and what are your concerns um, with regards to technology policy making, the area that you are focusing on? Yeah, no, uh, firstly, thanks, Matthias and Isip for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, this is a, a fascinating topic for, for my work. Um, I'm, I, I work for ITIF, I'm based here in DC, but I'm Australian, judging obviously from the accent, and uh, used to work for the Australian government, and so drawing some of those parallels in. Uh, I also grew up on a, a farm that exported beef uh, in the outback of Australia, so I, it always warms my heart when I get to talk about EU uh, farm, farming, uh, ag the agricultural policy and the problems it, it causes Australian farmers. But uh, with that said, uh, I want to start off, start off uh, by uh, thanking Amar and Frontier Economics for their report and study uh, to measuring in, in measuring the impact of the uh, concept of strategic economy. It's no easy task. And having done econometric modeling myself, I realized the challenge involved in, in trying to put all the pieces together. And I think it makes a really helpful contribution to the debate to highlight even just the indicative cost of these policies and the trade-offs, uh, which is much needed as a frustrating part of these debates around strategic autonomy is the lack of analysis, a lack of specificity, and any sort of sort of cost-benefit analysis, uh, which sort of goes to the Bettina's question about how do we take into account sort of um, our political objectives in this modeling and I mean, in some ways, it's about well presenting well what what level of cost, uh, trade or economic cost, are political leaders willing to accept in their pursuit of nebulous goals. And so, um, but more often than not, they just don't even um, try and highlight any cost because they 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 recognise it's probably significant and that its impact may be unevenly felt, especially as it relates to EU various EU member states, and so they don't want to draw attention to it. Um, and so I think it's really helpful in adding greater specificity and data and figures to this opaque, opaque strategy and set of policies uh, that European policymakers prefer to in terms of digital tech sovereignty. As they describe it as a strong yet nebulous concept, usually as it relates to data and technology, referring it to uh, asserting state control over data, digital, uh, data flows and digital technologies and that they often state that it helps them take back control and sovereignty from mainly US tech firms but also increasingly Chinese ones. And that this isn't a bug, but a central feature of this, how this strategy has, has evolved. And I contrast this with the evolving sort of associated strategy of economic security, which you hear increasingly referred to here in the United States, in Japan and elsewhere, as they seek to adjust to the changing global economy, the rise of China, and the growing concerns around supply chains and, and national security concerns in terms of how do they themselves balance up these new concerns um, in a way uh, that deals with their uh, trade issues, their technology issues, and their data-related issues. And so the EU's approach to strategic technology is certainly one approach, but um, I, I think it obviously uh, is being used as, uh, as a tool essentially for industrial policy in many regards. Um, many of the policies uh, Amar lists in the report I, I wouldn't necessarily put under this umbrella, uh, 
of strategic autonomy because some of them fill a needed vacuum uh, in, in, in sort of trade rules, given the WTO is sort of increasing irrelevance in addressing major concerns, especially about unfair trade practices. So the policies around subsidies and procurement and stuff like that, I wouldn't necessarily see that uh, it being fitting in the sort of the broader bucket of strategic autonomy. Um, uh, and it, which raises the point that while the WTO's use and relevance may be waning, its core principles of non-discrimination are still incredibly valuable as we look at and assess and weigh up uh, the policies that fall under this umbrella of strategic autonomy. And applying these to EU policies leads to a common refrain in that, that the goal is, in many regards, protectionism. And this isn't ambiguous. Uh, we don't need to tiptoe around this. There's senior leaders from German Chancellor Merkel or French, uh, French President uh, Macron who have explicitly called for both digital protectionism and data sovereignty when talking about this. And I find it somewhat ironic and interesting, but basically uh, that this is but the latest in a historical series of European policy efforts to undermine mainly American technology leadership and products. And just one example, historical example I'll read out. In a 1967 memorandum from Special Assistance uh, for Science and Technology uh, to President Johnson, quote, political concern in Europe with the technological gap remains high. They recognise that all of the major factors are ones that they must deal with themselves and there is no longer talk of a Marshall Plan for technology, but a deep uneasiness remains. We encountered evidence of rising nationalism everywhere, most clearly in Germany, where the view was expressed, for example, that a major modern state must have an independent capacity to produce computers, which are the key to the new society of the electronic age, end quote. Sounds rather familiar, right? And so this is where, where it leads us to where we are now in terms of it, the tech, uh, um, tech sovereignty doesn't necessarily need to be protectionist. There are many things that Europe can and is doing to uh, support its, the uh, industry's ability to, to innovate and compete. Um, but too often, whenever these debates come up, it's, there's, a, there's protectionist and restrictive elements inserted. And I also contrast to that to how other countries that are also like-minded uh, trading partners of the EU that support an open rules-based trading system, namely Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Japan, and other, otherwise, who are at now not only enacting new digital trade rules, including on data flows in a way that is far more meaningful than Europe's approach, um, but also new forms of digital cooperation that they proactively do while they're simultaneously considering domestic laws and regulations. That contrasts with Europe's, Europe's approach to rush to regulate and restrict and then retrospectively try and justify their approach and, and deal with the international externalities which are inevitably created. And that's, that's, that's where we're heading. And I really like Bettina's point about the sort of the spin-off effect or the, 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 the build-up of effects once you go down this road and, and what that entails. And what that entails in the tech and digital space is particularly troubling because while the French and others have tried direct subsidies to support local sort of essentially import substitution of cloud providers and other in Europe, what they're obviously relying on now are regulations to basically either explicitly exclude or make the life so difficult for foreign uh, tech firms that, that it gives local firms a, a major advantage in the market. And there's two key policies that I'll just mention here in passing is um, the new EU consideration of an EU-wide cloud cybersecurity regime which is um, at the moment currently based off a very restrictive French Secnum Cloud proposal, which is more akin to China's approach to the cloud market than it is to anything else, in that it clearly defines sovereignty as local control and ownership. So that for a cloud provider to be deemed trusted to manage both government data, but also data from a vast swath of the economy, it would need to be both locally owned and locally controlled. And that's, that would be uh, a huge change to the, 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 a fundamental part of the EU digital economy. The other key policy is the EU standardization strategy, which as, as it stands or as it recently stood, was in line with its WTO commitments 
and ensuring that it sets standards in a fair, open, transparent, sort of industry-driven way. And we've seen a number of measures enacted this year that exclude foreign um, participants from uh, standard setting bodies, uh, removing uh, the role of certain bodies where foreign firms and experts do play a role from these deliberations, all in the, the vague pursuit of protecting European values and interests, which again are not clearly defined or specified, nor are the, the, the cost benefits of these approaches uh, clearly sort of acknowledged up front. And in that, in doing so, they what's also equally troubling about it, which also points to its protectionist intent, they're lumping American experts and firms in with Chinese ones. And so which which points to that protectionist intent in that if there are fair and legitimate concerns about the role of, of certain firms, especially Chinese firms, in setting standards in Europe, there are ways to go about that. But it seems that those concerns are being used to enact broader, more restrictive controls that impact US firms. And so, again, it draws me back to my point is that these, the, a lot of these concerns are legitimate, but unfortunately, as it's been defined and applied thus far, this concept of, of, of strategic autonomy seems to be a stalking horse for uh, protectionist-based industrial policy, when that doesn't necessarily need to be the case, uh, in that there are other ways to address legitimate underlying concerns in line with um, uh, like-minded value-sharing trading partners, uh, but that seems to be secondary or tertiary to the EU's main objective at the moment. We obviously see associated concerns being addressed at the TPC, but they're of a far lower level of ambition than, than what's necessary really to address some of these issues. But I'll end it there and um, I'll, I'll, open, I'll leave it to further questions. Thank you, Nigel. That was uh, a very insightful contribution, a uh, very frank contribution. Um, you talked about not only the risk, but the de facto, you know, existence of discriminatory design in many EU policies, particularly in the area of technology policy. Um, and um, when I looked into strategic autonomy ambitions and actual policies, especially in the area of tech and data governance, I realized that many of these ambitions are inherently guided by a European Union first impulse. Policymakers follow the assumption that EU values, you refer to them, are in a way superior, or at least they should be different in the future from values uh, of third countries, values in third countries, and corresponding market regulation. And you can also get the impression, if you look into the past, that major strategic autonomy policies represent a relapse of the EU to the old policy of EU member states to design and enforce their own policies, their own regulations, without properly considering the costs of regulatory fragmentation and economic disintegration from ours. And I wonder how you feel about this. You mentioned the TTC and at least on paper, a certain willingness of governments to cooperate in areas of uh, of subsidies, cybersecurity, and also values. Um, and do we see similar developments as we see in the EU, you know, the explicit willingness to kind of regulate or we disintegrate from ours? Do we see these developments in the US as well? Or are there nuances that should be taken into consideration? Is, you know, the, the US, can it still be considered as the advocate for open markets and the principle of non-discrimination in the world? Yeah, no, I, I mean, a great point. And I mean, I think, a a certain point in the current debate and focus on EU, uh, US policy as it relates to the IRA Act and certain EV provisions is to put that in perspective in that if the US acted with half of the outrage that European policymakers have reacted in response to that, to what Europe has done on data and digital, we would have uh, the tenor of the transatlantic trade relationship would be vastly different. And so I think it's important to put that in uh, perspective in that Overall, the US's approach to these issues is, is evolving in terms of it's trying to create and use new vehicles to address issues that may have been primarily re regulated to the WTO in the past. It's the Trade, uh, Trade and Technology Council of Europe, it's IPEF, it's the Quad, and there are various other sort of bilateral initiatives underway where it's trying to figure out 
a new way to address these associated concerns, which I would put under the concept of economic security, but in a way that is far more targeted. Uh, and, and so uh, I think um, that, that lays the ground for some really new and interesting work, which has taken place, I think, in the Asia Pacific. It, 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 there's enormous opportunity transatlantically with the TTC, but to be frank again, I am expecting very little of meaningful outcomes at the TTC. The bar is very low and Europe has uh, not been sort of very proactive in pushing forward for an ambitious agenda. It's, it's in many regards defensive and in many regards they're pushing for America to accept their position and they're receiving very little pushback from their American counterparts. And so there's a lot they could be doing together um, and should be doing together on, on cybersecurity, on data, on export controls and any number of other issues, but um, they need to be, they need to level set and get on the same page and, and, and sort of mutually disarm in a way to recognize that as a point I always make, they share far much more in common than, than they do apart, especially in contrast to China and other major players out there. And so uh, just cybersecurity, for example, I'll end with the example there. So the EU cloud cybersecurity regime on its face is a good idea, a standardised cybersecurity regime for providers across the country, uh, across the, the continent. And, and, and that's good, simplifies things for everyone, makes it easier. But then it's been, the French have used it as an opportunity to insert um, uh, restrictions on control and ownership, which no other country uses. Mm -hmm. And that would fundamentally alter not just cybersecurity, cloud cybersecurity service for government data and services, but for a vast swath of the commercial market. And that again is vastly different to the schemes that run in the UK, Australia, the US and elsewhere. And the underlying bogeyman that they highlight here is extraterritorial access under the US Cloud Act. Hypothetical, largely hasn't been proven, yet even there, even if they have legitimate concerns there, there's a legitimate way to address it. And that's to use the EU Evidence Act as the basis to enter into negotiations, which have already started with the US on a Cloud Act updated agreement for the exchange of law enforcement data. But instead of doing that, they're using it as an opportunity to try and assert local control and ownership over cloud in Europe. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Nigel. Um, we should get to our audience for a few questions. Unfortunately, I don't see any questions from the audience in the chat box, but there is one hand that's up. Pasi Haiki Varanma, please, you have the floor. Are you still with us? I think she left. Okay, are there any more questions from our audience? Ignacy Utieski, please. So can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much for the webinar and for the very interesting presentation and discussion. I have a question with regards to the uh, model and to the calculations that have been presented at the beginning. The question is, what is the baseline scenario? Do you, do you assume that the economy develops in business as usual, or do you include possible tensions and fragmentations due to a trade war between US and China and the EU and China? Thank you. Very well. Amar, would you like to get back to this? Thank you. Yeah, excellent question. So. In approaching this, we uh, we basically took the baseline as being the current state of play. Um, and so in the baseline, you have policies that are already enacted, like the GDPR and so forth. And so what we've looked at is a, uh, a, a slew of policies, um, which are at the moment in the proposal stage, and then projected what their impacts would be. And we measured, uh, we tried to quantify these policies using various uh, policy databases that uh, that are available, uh, the Global Trade Alert database, the OECD Services Trade Restrictionist Index, and so forth. Uh, we didn't, in the baseline, uh, in, uh, sort of incorporate any new development, uh, sort of, you know, sort of a particular scenario regarding uh, US-China uh, relationships, for example. 
Um, so we, we largely took the baseline as being the state of the world uh, as it is. Okay, one more question from Manfred Shekulin. Manfred, floor is yours. Manfred, we can't hear you. We can't hear you, sorry. Yeah, seems to be an issue with the microphone. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now we can hear you, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I think the the reason why you don't get anything uh, in the chat is that it's deactivated. It's not possible to pose a question in the chat, at least not for oh. me. Okay. Uh, uh, a question to Arma and one to Nigel. Uh, thank you for the study. I found it very interesting. Uh, one thing that you uh, that the study, I think, or in your presentation, the point you make is uh, that there is a difference between going it alone. Uh, and looking for multilateral WTO compatible uh, solutions. I completely uh, agree with that. But the question is whether in order to get your partners to sit down in a multilateral framework, you sometime have to show your seriousness uh, by at least threatening to go it uh, alone. And uh, I have a feeling uh, that that is what the EU is doing now after having played for decades the good uh, uh, guy on the block uh, and having received uh, rather tough uh, responses from the US, now they enter the threatening game, uh, so to say. And on Nigel, my point was, uh, I agree with everything you said with one exception, if you allow me. So. Uh, that is giving Australia as an example for market-oriented solutions uh, is really uh, the Australian uh, test uh, for inward investment, the investment screening procedure that blatantly uh, uh, is against the EU. Uh, it is non. It is discriminatory against uh, the EU, and the government even states that. Is that really the example that the EU should follow, rather the way it is going down? Thank you. Thank you very much. Very very good questions. Um, Bettina, you raised your hand. Do you want to respond first, and then we turn to Nigel and then Omar? Thank you very much. No, I just would like to um, link. Another comment to what just uh, Manfred said on Australia, and I'm sure Nigel knows that. Uh, I, I mean, that's anyhow always very difficult to find a kind of an average evaluation whether a country is market open or not. So if you look in detail, it's always a kind of balance. Or it, it depends a bit on a country's strategic interests in different sectors. And just to uh, add upon that on agriculture and SPS regulations and uh, all these quarantine things, not only on human public health, but as well on animal health is very, very strict in Australia. So it's, it's anyhow difficult. That was just uh, an amendment. Thank you. Sure. Nigel? Yeah, no, uh, thanks for the question, Manfred. Uh, I think, I mean, on agricultural policy, there really is no comparison between Australia and Europe. It's just, I mean, Australia's uh, in, entire trade policy is it dependent on open market for agricultural products, and, and Europe has, has represented uh, barriers for, for for a long time. And so, I wish the folks that are currently involved in an EU Australia FTA all the best in trying to to to, to find a way forward for easier, better trade. Um, my comment to Australia is mainly that. And it's, and it's a comment that may be useful here because if folks are stuck in a Europe space for these debates is that when it, it kind of, when it comes to countries uh, readjusting both trade, security and technology policy to account with growing concerns around China, 
Australia is more often ahead of the curve than every other country. And if you go to any cyber or digital related debate here in the United States, the number of times I've heard Australia used as the model for how the US is thinking about how to uh, adjust foreign investment reviews, export controls, uh, secure data and technology, critical infrastructure and such. And so Australia's acted quicker uh, in a way on these issues than most other countries, followed by Japan. Eventually then it gets to the United States and then two or three years down the track, Europe trials. And I've seen this play out as it relates to China related policies. It, the difference in Europe's approach now compared to five years ago, compared to 10 years ago is transformative. And you see these, this ripple effect of, of lead and, and, and follow. And so, uh, I just, I also think Australia is a relevant case because it's more approximate to many other middle countries that are uh, more invested in an open rules-based trading system than say Europe seems to be. It portrays itself as such, but a lot of these policies are hugely problematic and just are, are not under consideration uh, by these other middle powers that depend on open trade. And so that's, that's but that's also why you're seeing Australia, Singapore, and others seek about trying to create many plurilateral arrangements around digital and technology because they recognize that if they don't step up and show leadership in, in, in showing another way that is cooperative and is still open, um, that, uh, that, that their, their interests will be thrown by the wayside because Europe's strategic autonomy favors Europe first and everyone else second and third. Thank you, Nigel. Amar? Thank you. So yeah, so is it uh, is it worthwhile being aggressive to then uh, foster cooperation? That's I think a dangerous calculation. Um, there, there was a school of thought saying that you know the Trump administration's approach to China was essentially to force it back to the negotiating table uh, and and uh, you know deal with perceived non compliance with its WTO commitments. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, in, in, that's main. That's not really a question that you can un, understand from an economic modeling point of view. But I think it's it's a risky endeavor. Uh, I think ultimately, what you need to look at is, you know, what's the underlying philosophy that's driving these measures? And I think uh, a lot of it really is, you know, about carving out policy space and disengaging with multilateral pro processes to to an extensive degree i think um what what's i think this is the main point is that if you wind back the clock about two decades you find very similar protectionist principles at at play in the eu but you found a much stronger willingness on the part of the institutions to contain them and channel them into a multilateral framework and deal with there uh when i used to work at the wto with pascal lamy he used to always say well the eu's trade policy changed because it started prioritizing the interests of the consumer or the producer that by the way and I'm tipping the hat to nigel here is is a line taken from the australian productivity commission um, when it was describing the australians reform process under the hall keating governments uh, in the 80s and 90s i see less of a sense of that and ultimately it's that lack of internal anchoring that's going to be difficult and why i don't think that you know ultimately you know uh, the the idea that being aggressive is going to force cooperation will will really work because I'm not sure that appetite for cooperation really is is internalized as it was back in the 80s and 90s not just in the EU but also in the US when the US launched the Uruguay round or helped launch it it and the EU were basically trying to discipline internal domestic protectionist pressures that's why the the old GATT magic worked and that magic is I think lacking at the moment. Very well, that was a very good final statement from Amar, the guy who knows the WTO, I would say in a way inside out and knows how economic diplomacy works in practice. Uh, I would share these, these observations. Uh, and I would add that you should not be aggressive to like-minded countries, partners in the TTC, the US primarily, but also the G20, the larger group of OECD countries. And you should bear in mind that European values are not so unique to Europe. They are shared by essentially this larger group of countries. Um, 
But um, with that, I would like to uh, be mindful of our time. I think we are on time. It is uh, 4.15. Uh, we need to come to a close. And I would like to thank all of our speakers for their excellent contributions. Uh, I'd like to thank our audience to stay with us. Uh, there were still uh, 80 people watching uh, until the end of this seminar, which is pretty good. Uh, and I would like to encourage our audience to approach me or our panelists individually in case uh, you have any questions or comments or requests. As I mentioned, the study is available for download at uh, esife.org. And with that, thanks again to all of you. It was a very good seminar. I look forward to um, having you on, uh, on, on future occasions and uh, have a good day.